Hi, and welcome to Diversity in the Community. I am your host, Teresa Harris. This year, I will be celebrating 11 years on Win TV with Diversity in the Community. I normally have guests on the show, but tonight I thought I'd do a little something different and actually show you a little bit of my talents on tonight. I'm going to start out by telling you that um, I started a new thing. I mean, fell in love with writing. At first, I didn't think I could be a, a writer, but um, I ended up joining a group called the Journey Writers. And it's a, a group where we get together and we, um, it's a group of poets, uh, playwrights, um, people that write lyrics to songs, um, short stories. And I, I went in one day, I was invited by a friend, and, um, and, I, and I wrote a little piece and I was looking for them to really critique me to death, but they didn't. So I said, well, maybe I can do this. So tonight I'm going to um, I'm going to read you a story, but the story has to do with with something that was really true. I uh, we had a group of people that come in uh, that came into our group, um, and they talked about organ donations. And some of these people were re recipients of organs, and some uh, people had given uh, family members organs um, away to other people. And there was a young, uh, young lady who told us about her son. And she said that her son um, was a, a good athlete. He was good in school, um, wonderful young man. And she would always take him wherever he had to go. But on this particular night, um, he said, Mom, can I ride with my friends? And she was like, no, I'll take you where you want to go. And he pleaded with her, come on, Mom, I've been doing good in school, please. Let me, let me go with my friends. And so she said, okay. That was the night that he got in an accident and he was brain dead. Um, and one of the people, so her, she gave his, his organs away. Of course, she at first, she was like, no, I don't want to do it, uh, but she did. And so one of the, the people in the group um, asked her, once the other child got your son's heart, was there any similarities between your son and um, the child that got the, uh, the heart? And she said, I am so glad you asked. She said, because um, the young man that got received my son's heart uh, never had an interest in painting or anything. And my son loved to do art. He loved painting. And she said he couldn't wait to get well enough to be able to draw or write or paint, whatever. And she said the similarities between the art that her son did, or the paintings that her son did, and the child that got her son's heart was just amazing. And so I decided to, um, we were challenged to write stories about the stories that we had heard that night about the, um, the people that came to visit our group. So this story I'm going to read tonight is um, from the story that I heard from the, from the young lady. The name of my piece is, Who Loves You? I Do. Being a single parent and having no other family, at least I knew of, my seven-year-old daughter, Nettie, meant the world to me. I loved her more than words could say. Everything I did was for her. Every hour I worked was to secure her future. I wanted her to finish school, go to college, marry, have children, and be happy. In other words, I wanted her to have everything I never had. We would go through the same routine each morning before school. I would pull the covers off her and she would put them back over her face. After doing this a few times, I would pull her by her feet to try and drag her out of the bed, and, and she would make her body as limp as she could. Now, we would both be giggling the whole time. I would finally say in my fake, stern voice, okay, enough. It's time to get ready for school. Third grade ain't no joke, young lady. <laughs> With that said, Nettie would jump up, put her arms around me, nuzzle her face into my neck and say, who loves you, mommy? I do. We would pick out her outfit with matching bows. 
She loved yellow. What a beautiful, sweet child. I was truly blessed. It was a beautiful fall morning. The sun was shining so bright. I would always stand in the doorway until Nettie got on the bus. This particular morning, the bus stopped and put out the sign on the side. Nettie skipped across the street, turning to give me one more wave. When all of a sudden a car came speeding down the street and because I guess he was blinded by the sun, he hit my Nettie. I don't know how I got across the street so fast. All I remember is holding my baby, my Nettie, in my arms. She was looking into my eyes and gasping for breath. Everything from that moment was all a blur. The screams, the police, the ambulance, the hospital, all a blur until I heard the words, I am sorry. Nettie's not going to make it. Make it? What do, what do you mean? She's still breathing. She'll be okay. She has to be okay. You don't know my Nettie. She's strong and, and she's stubborn. She will be okay. The doctor said, I am sorry, but Nettie is brain dead. She will never recover. I know it's a horrible time for you, he said, but would you consider donating Nettie's organs? Uh, there will be so many children she will be able to help, and this tragedy won't be for nothing. You get away from me right now, I said. You must be crazy. You are not going to take anything away from my baby. After I cried until I could not cry anymore, reality set in. I, I researched what organ donation meant. At least if I donated her organs, some part of her would still be living. With a heavy heart, I decided to donate Nettie's organs. I was numb during the funeral. My, my mind was blank. I don't remember much of it at all. Just people hugging me and telling me what a beautiful little girl she was. The hardest thing was to leave that little casket out there at the cemetery. But in the back of my mind, I was saying, she's, she's still alive. There, there are children somewhere living with her organs. I found out that the heart went to a white child in Mississippi, but they decided to have no contact. The other organs went to help many other children, which I received thank you letters, all except the heart recipient. Eighteen years had passed since the death of my Nettie, and during those years, I was not living, I was merely existing. I was glad to be able to work from home because that meant, that meant I did not have to deal with anyone face to face. I did not attend any social events, did not go to church anymore because I was so mad with God. One day while riding in my car and feeling as low as I could be. I tried to find a, a song on the radio. It stopped on a gospel station. I, I started to turn, but for some reason I did not. The minister said as if he were talking to me. So you're angry with God. Believe it or not, God loves you. He said, I know your heart has been broken, but it ain't over until God says it's over. He can perform a miracle in your life. 
Just talk to him, open your heart, and, and invite him in. I pulled my car to the side of the road because I felt like the minister was talking directly to me. I screamed, pointing my finger towards heaven and said, Lord, how could you have done this to me? How could you have let my child die? You know she was all I had. You know how much I loved you and I, I served you. I'm asking you today, God, to fix my life. Heal my heart. I need something, Lord, or I won't survive. It's been 18 years, Lord. I know people say it's, it's time to, to let it go, but I can't. I'm tired and I'm so lonely, I miss my baby. Lord, please help me. I miss my baby. I sat there and I cried and I cried, but I, I actually felt better because I had not cried since my baby died. I felt relieved, so I pulled myself together and I drove home. When I arrived at my apartment complex, there was a car parked in front with a very attractive young white woman. I, I got out of my car and I started towards the front door and suddenly our, our eyes met. There was such a sparkle in her eyes, familiar somehow. It was a feeling I could not explain. A warm feeling came all over me. I went on into my apartment and moments later, the bell rang. I peeked out and <laughs> there she was again, the young lady from the car. She was dressed in a soft yellow sweater and yellow wool pants. I opened the door and said, can I help you? Who are you looking for? I saw you outside. Hi, she said with a southern accent. I'm looking for you, Mrs. Andrews. Uh, my name is Nora Glendale. I know you don't know me, but I have wanted to meet you since I was a child. You see, you gave me the greatest gift anyone could ever give another person. I am the recipient of your daughter's heart. I wanted to meet you so very badly to thank you for donating your daughter's organs, but my, my parents would not have it. I did not realize why they were so against reaching out to you. After they passed away, I, I researched everything on my own and realized why they did not reach out to you. <laughs> you see, my parents were very prejudiced and did not want anyone to know that I had the heart of a black child. They hated anyone who was not white. I have always wanted to meet you face to face and to thank you for the gift of life. When I was a child, I, I could not take two steps without getting out of breath. The doctors told my parents I did not have long to live. After your gift, I started feeling better and better. I did great in school. I, I finished college. I got married and have two beautiful children. And it's all because of you and your daughter. I stood there speechless and in disbelief. Is that why I felt something familiar when I looked in her eyes? That warm feeling when I saw her smile? <laughs> no, it's my imagination. I want to talk, but nothing will come out. I'm frozen, and I still had not asked her to come in. And she said, I know it's a lot to take in. 
cannot come in. I still could not speak, so I nodded my head, yes. She came in and closed the door behind her. She said, you don't know how much you mean to me and how long I've waited for this moment. She said, I, I miss my mother and I know you miss your daughter. If it's all right, maybe we can become friends. Um, can I give you a hug, she said. I looked at her with tears in my eyes, still speechless, and nodded yes. I had not been hugged since my Nettie died. <laughs> she put her arms around me. She held me really tight nuzzled her face into my neck and whispered in my ear, who loves you, Mrs. Andrews? I do. Thank you. This story is in dedication to my brother, and I'm not going to really use his name tonight, but um, my brother was in the Army, and we were very close. So this is also dedicated to all of those people who've had young men that left home as teenagers, went into the service and um, came back different because of all the things that they saw. And some never came back. So this is a dedication to my brother and all of those young men. <laughs> when you're down in trouble, you need some loving care and nothing, no nothing's going right. Close your eyes and think of me and soon I will be there to brighten even your darkest night. You just call out my name, and you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you have to do is call, and I'll be there, yes I will. You got a friend. The hardest thing, or should I say, one of the hardest things I've ever experienced was to see the effects the war had on my youngest brother, Danny. I was a young girl and he was a young teenager. Danny was happy-go-lucky, funny, <laughs> Loved life, and most importantly, he was my best friend. When Danny was not with his buddies, he would spend hours with me, putting together model airplanes, uh, taking them to Keeney Park and watching them soar through the air. It was thrilling to see those little beige paper planes with the red decorations actually flying and knowing that we created them together. Even when our planes did not have a successful flight, it was still fun just being with my brother. I did not care for girly toys, so when, when Danny gave me his old cowboy and Indian toys, I was delighted. <laughs> we would lay on our stomachs and pretend we were fighting. I don't remember whose side I was on. I just remember that we had fun. Yes, Danny was my brother my hero, my best friend. One day the news came that Danny would be drafted into the army. I think mom cried. I didn't understand what it meant and Danny thought it was kind of exciting. He assured mom that everything would be okay. After boot camp, the news came that Danny 
was going to be sent to war. Events of the war was all over the news, stories of young men being killed every day. We prayed that God would protect our Danny. As time passed, the news came that Danny was coming home. <laughs> I was beside myself. I missed him so much. I could not contain my excitement. My mother, father, and all of the family was excited, not only about Danny's return, but two of my cousins were also coming home. I could not sleep just imagining the great reunion between me and my brother. <laughs> I imagined that he would walk into the room, hug my mom and dad, and try to sweep, swoop me up in his arms. He would laugh and say, my, you have grown. I can't even pick you up anymore. He would give me a big old hug and tell me how much he missed me. The day was finally here. The room was filled with family and friends and someone yelled, he's here. Oh my. I pushed in front of everyone so that I would be the first one he sees when he enters the room. I had on my Sunday's best, pink dress, pink tights, and black, pink, patent leather loafers. <laughs> my brother Danny walked through the door with his hat in his hand. He looked so handsome in his green uniform, hair cut real close, and his black shiny shoes. He walked right past me. He hugged my mom and dad awkwardly and loosely shook a few hands. I ran over, stood right in front of him and said, Danny, don't you remember me? I miss you. When our eyes met, his eyes looked empty to me and he just said, oh, oh, hi. And that was, that was it. My best friend left for the war, a funny, loving, happy-go-lucky teenager and returned emotionally detached from the things he once knew and loved. He tried to live a regular life. He, he married, had a son, bought a house but he was never the same. And he always seemed to be in pain, which he would soothe with some gin and a glass of Kool-Aid. <laughs> I'm guessing that he had post-traumatic stress syndrome. My sister told me that one day he was hiding behind the couch because he thought someone was after him. I'm glad I didn't witness that. At the age of 24, I got married and eventually had two children. One night out of the blue, Danny paid me a visit. It was strange because it was late and the children were already in bed. I asked what made him stop by and he said, I, I just wanted to see you, sis. He had on a white t-shirt I'll never forget, and a, a pair of uh, jean shorts. He sat in my doorway, and for a few minutes, he stared, got up, gave me a hug, and left. He went to the hospital the next day, and two days later, he died of pancreatic cancer. Danny was 39 years old. I later found out that he knew he was dying, but he did not tell anyone. I wonder if he stopped by that night because he remembered for just a moment that he used to be my best friend. The end. <laughs> Woo. 
I want, I want to share a, a song with you guys that um, I heard in the middle of the night. And at first I said, well, I'll, I'll get up in the morning and I'll write it down or whatever, but it just kept tugging on my heart to, to just go ahead and sing it into my phone. And so I figured that this song was going to be a message to people, um, that God knows your heart. Don't worry about people. God knows your heart. So I'm going to sing the song without any music or anything, and I hope that it would touch somebody out there watching. Like I said, it's called God Knows Your Heart. I can talk to him without saying a word. I can moan to him without it ever being heard. Mm -hmm. I can moan to him, still he understands me, because God, he knows my heart. He knows my heart. He knows my every thought. He knows me so well, still he gave his son on the cross. I know I'm not worthy, I'm sure not perfect, but he still loves me. He knew I would struggle with sin, but he loved me just the same. I knew that I lived a life of sin. I said, I got to get it right before I come to him. But mm, he said, my child, just come as you are. Man looks at the outward, but I see your heart. He knows my heart. He knows my every thought. He knows me so well. Still he gave his son on the cross. I know I'm not worthy. I'm sure not perfect, but he still loved me. He knew I would struggle with sin but he loved me just the same. He knew I would struggle with sin, but he loved me just the same. Thank you for watching Diversity in the Community. I hope something I have said has helped you tonight. And um, I'm just celebrating 11 years on WIN TV. Again, thank you for watching. Good night.